Okay, folks, I think we're going to get started. So, hi, everyone. Uh, you may recall seeing alarming news in July that North Korea had launched a series of ballistic missiles for the first time in months. Uh, though all the missiles landed in the ocean, tensions in the region were high, particularly as some of the tests occurred just a few days before the 70th anniversary of the armistice uh, that ended the Korean War. So uh, naturally, there was uh, a lot of um, strong rhetoric back and forth, including from leaders in South Korea, Japan, and the US. In response, a certain North Korean official stated, the US should stop its foolish act of provoking the DPRK, um, even by imperiling its security. It is a daydream for the US to think that it can stop the advance of the DPRK. So that was quite a strong statement, but this is interesting, um, not only for the statement, but who said it? Uh, it actually was Kim Yo Jong, the de facto deputy to her brother, Supreme Leader Kim Jong Un. So as tonight's speaker will explain, Kim Yo Jong holds a very fascinating and powerful position in North Korea's regime and will probably play a crucial role in its future. So um, with that sobering thought, good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Chat and Chowder. We're delighted that you're here with us in the room or on the Zoom. Uh, my name is Mary Eintema. I serve as president of World Boston. And before we get started, just a couple of reminders. As you may know, the mission of World Boston is to foster international engagement and global cooperation. So thank you for being part of this mission. Right away, thank you to our hosts at Foley and Lardner for their kind hospitality. Um, I also want to shout out Natalie Mace, who is behind the scenes and out in front as uh, Director of Global Engagement Programs, um, and also other great World Boston colleagues and World Boston board members. All of my colleagues and board members here, raise your hands, um, and everybody else, go talk to them. So. Um, Last, certainly not least, we want to thank the Lowell Institute, which generously supports our Chat and Chowder series. And we're thrilled that as of September, Chat and Chowder is free of charge. This is a big deal, and we can't do this without the Lowell Institute's support, and we also can't do it without you. So please uh, learn more um, on our website, worldboston.org, about how you can support us financially if you're able to do so, and you too will get uh, very chic um, little button like uh, Gordon has if you're able to support us. Yeah, the fashion statement. Now at long last, uh, tonight's program. Uh, this is really a thrill to be joined by Dr. Sun, Yoon, sorry, Sung Yoon Lee, who is um, Wilson International Competition Fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Previously, he taught Korean history uh, here at the Fletcher School at Tufts. He has written on the politics of the Korean Peninsula for numerous publications, including New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post. He's testified um, in the U.S. House of Representatives and has advised senior lead leaders, including the uh, U.S. President. He's the author of tonight's topic, the uh, author of tonight's book, the bestseller, The Sister, North Korea's Kim uh, Yo Jong, The Most Dangerous Woman in the World, which was published in the US in September and has already been translated into nine languages. Um, also note the exciting news that Scott Steindorf, a, a well-known TV and movie producer, has secured feature film rights um, and will be turning the sister into a documentary uh, for which Dr. Lee will be serving as executive producer. So once you've read the book, then go see the movie. <laughs> Um, I, I will. Um, pretty exciting. So uh, with that, sorry, uh, I'm missing a page. Uh, yes, watch it as a documentary. I think uh, that's what I wanted to say. But until that happens, um, very happy that we can turn our attention to the book. Thank you for joining us tonight. And Yoon, I will turn things over to you. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction, President Mary Aitema, and the 
World Boston fans, sponsors, and friends, and Natalie, and Foley, and Lardner, and the Lowell Institute, and Consul General Kim Jae-hui, Consul General of the Republic of Korea to Boston, and his colleagues, Deputy Consul General Hong and Consul Kim. Thank you for being here. I am very honored and happy to be here, but at the risk of never being invited back to World Boston, <laughs> allow me to make a bizarre statement and then follow it up with a serious grammatical error. First, the very strange assertion. I believe sincerely that the North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un is possibly the second most readily recognized head of state by photograph, face, and name in the world, perhaps second or third, only after the leaders of the United States, possibly Russia. I believe Kim Jong-un is more famous than Chinese President Xi Jinping. And you're thinking, no, how can that be? By extension, I believe Kim Jong-un is um, by far the most widely recognized Korean individual outside the Korean Peninsula. Some of you younger folks in the audience, my former great students at Tufts, you're thinking, no, BTS, the fabulous Korean boy band is more famous. No, 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 no. There's no comparison. BTS is fabulous. In 2019, before the onset of COVID, they sold out more stadium shows than Taylor Swift, Madonna, U2 combined. They are a phenomenon, but come on. For those of us over the age of, say, 35, 40, who's BTS? Whereas Kim Jong-un, by virtue of his belligerence, his strange statecraft, which is an um, amalgam, a mix of cringing medieval mores and buffoonish bellicosity, he resonates, he grips our attention, and often we tend to patronize him because he's so strange. We want to mock him. If there were such a thing as an international mockability index, North Korea would reign supreme, would be number one forever, perhaps. But we do so, we underestimate North Korea at our own peril. They are a small country of about 25 million to total population, backward, poor. The regime is not poor, the people are poor. They have nukes. They have intercontinental ballistic missiles that can hit every part of the continental United States. They fought the U.S. with considerable help from China to a draw in the Korean War of 1950 to 1953. They are real. They look weird. They say crazy sounding things, but they are not to be underestimated. Next the serious grammatical error. I say this a lot because North Korea is so unique, so different that I say North Korea is uniquely unique. And each time I say that, I see my Church of England primary school grammar teacher wincing in pain because unique is an absolute adjective. You can't be more or less unique, but I do say it because North Korea is so unconventional. It's really different. For example, North Korea has, by certain metrics, the world's biggest standing army. In absolute terms, in sheer numbers of men serving in the military, North Korea is number three or four in the world for a nation of 25 million people. In terms of the percent of the population, able-bodied men serving in the army, North Korea is by far the biggest army, has the, by far the biggest standing army. Uh, about 20% of all able-bodied men between the age of 16, 17, and 50 are in the army at any given time. In terms of national defense, defense budget, North Korea spends anywhere between 25 and 35% of its meager GDP on defense spending. No other country comes close to that. 
According to a monumental United Nations study on human rights in North Korea published on February 17, 2014, quote, the nature, scale, and gravity of North Korea's crimes against humanity reveal a nation that does not have any parallel in the contemporary world, end quote, meaning the worst. And this is corroborated by UN agencies, human rights watchdogs, and so on. To me, the uniquest, that's not a proper word, but the most unique aspect of North Korean state and society is the following. North Korea is the first and only, and I believe forever will remain the only, industrialized, urbanized, literate country to have undergone a famine. Let me say that again, perhaps in a more pithy way if I can. North Korea is the world's first and only industrialized, urbanized, literate country that suffered a devastating famine. Famines have been with us throughout human existence, and today there are famine and famine-like conditions in many parts of the world, tragically, but never has there been a famine in a primarily literate society, loosely defined, meaning anyone above the age of 16 can write their own name, read, write simple sentences. That's the meaning of literacy. In a literate society, in an industrialized society, there has never been a famine. And in the mid to late 1990s, perhaps upwards of 10% of the North Korean people died of starvation and related illnesses, diseases. This is a unique phenomenon. And it's been almost 30 years since the onset of the North Korean famine in 1995. And each year, without fail, North Korea is among the world's top three, sometimes top five, nations with the most severe food insecurity, according to various UN reports, one of them being the prevalence of undernourishment among the total population. There is no such list that would be undiplomatic for the UN to release such a list. It would be uh, perhaps demeaning. I compiled, put together these lists of the most serious um, famine-like nations. Central African state, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Haiti, North Korea, all, always in the top five or six. It's very unique. It's really unnatural. No other country on the top 10 or top 50 list is an industrialized country where there is no functional illiteracy. There are many countries on that list where adult illiteracy hovers around 50%, upwards of 80% among the female population. And these are all immiserated economies, often beset by internal uprising, rebellion, insurrection, which of course naturally depress foreign investment, trade, and so on. North Korea is not like that. My point here is the ongoing food insecurity crisis every year. This is man-made, it's man-sustained. If Kim Jong-un chose to spend a tiny fraction of his vast wealth with which to import food and distribute it in an equitable fashion, no man, woman, child in North Korea would be hungry, but he chooses not to. So. North Korea is a uniquely strange and cruel totalitarian state, male-dominated, one of the most militaristic and totalitarian states in world history. And out of this macabre, strange, absolutist, medieval-style monarchy, pretending to be a communist egalitarian republic, has emerged a young, pretty woman called Kim Yo-jong. I first became interested in this figure in the wake of the death of her father, 
the second generational North Korean dictator Kim Jong-il, who died in mid-December 2011. And then a couple of days later, North Korea announced it, the death of the great leader, so-called, and held awake the dead late great leader, his corpse was displayed in a visible glass casket above a bed of flowers, and Pyongyang, the capital city, favored elite residents, came by the hundreds, wailing, crying, and mourning the death of this great leader. And on the last day, Kim Jong-un, still very young at the time, not quite 28, stood there, he was by then a known entity, known to be the successor. And at times, he took out a handkerchief and wiped his eyes, too. He was sobbing, too. But behind the next North Korean leader stood a young woman in traditional Korean mourning garb, black dress with white stripes. And, you know, there are cameras everywhere. And the proper way of mourning in Korean culture to a less extent, but still in South Korea too, is to pull your heart out, really wail and cry audibly. So the Pyongyang citizens, citizens were doing that, but there she stood, a young woman, her cheeks sunken, hollow, as if she'd not eaten anything in several days, completely dejected and completely oblivious to who may be watching, what cameras might be trained on her just standing there sobbing visibly, crying, looking profoundly sad. And I thought, that has to be his daughter. I did not know who she was, what her name was. None of us did, virtually no one. But then she made her splashy international debut by visiting South Korea on February 9th, 2018, for the occasion, on the occasion of the opening ceremony of the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics hosted by South Korea. It seemed that from the moment her plane, or her brother's plane, touched down at Incheon International Airport, the major international airport in South Korea, all eyes were trained on her, eager to catch the first glimpse of this royal personage princess from Pyongyang. I watched intently too. And when we saw on cable TV, South Korean TV, the first real shot of Kim Yo-jong in South Korea, there she was. The delegation was led to the VIP reception lounge at the airport. And the nominal head of the delegation was a 90-year-old man called Kim Yong-nam, who had been around for 50 years, quite a survivor. He walked in and then he walked in first and then he looked a bit nervous as if done something wrong, a taboo perhaps. Where's the more important person? And there she walked in, erect carriage, head up, chin up, showing not an iota of excitement or nervousness, her gaze fixed on maybe one or two points on the wall like this, as if she had just entered her own living room. And I realized, wow, that kind of confidence, the ability to exude confidence and imperial arrogance even, that of course comes from royal training. Like all other royalties, the children are trained to project self-confidence, perhaps elegance, perhaps a bit of arrogance too. And the nominal head, the 90-year-old gentleman, gestured to her to take the seat of honor across the table from the South Korean lead host, Minister of Unification. And she said, no, 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 you take it. And then he again asked her, no, please take the seat. And she said again, with a smile, she said, you take it. And on the news networks, all the experts and news cadres declaimed, she's so pretty and she's so polite. <clears throat> I 
had a different reaction to that because in Korean custom, Korean culture, if you were really deferential, you would cup your hands like this and say to the older person, no, please take this seat. Whereas what she did was this, take it. It was packaged nicely with a nice smile, but it was an order. And he took the head, of, head seat. And thereafter, later in the day, when she and the 90-year-old Mr. Kim were seated at the VIP royal box for the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics, I found the seating arrangement very strange. The North Koreans were seated above President Moon Jae-in, President Moon of South Korea, the host, and also Vice President Mike Pence and Mrs. Pence, the lead U.S. delegation to the opening ceremony, uh, and also above the late Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and other dignitaries. Okay, maybe it was an accident, but the optics were strange because the North Koreans were already there, and when President Moon made his entrance, he looked up to Kim Yo-jong, and they shook hands, and she smiled, but standing there above the South Korean president, she did not extend her arm. In Korean culture, to show deference and proper respect, you often, like, shake hands with both arms. You pour wine for the older senior person with two hands like this. No, her right hand not even extended, her right elbow right by her waist like this, while the South Korean president was. I thought it really weird. And you'll have to read the book, but there's a story, there's a reason behind that. It was not a random chance kind of seating arrangement. She demanded it to be seated above Mike Pence and President Moon. Since the onset of COVID in 2020, Kim Yo-jong has issued over 40 written statements under her own name. The first was on March 3rd, 2020, and each of them has a streak of sardonic wit and vulgarity and nasty personalized invective toward the South Korean president, the then South Korean president Moon, the current president Yoon, a little bit of jab at President Trump as well, and also nasty words for former US presidents, Obama and Biden as well. I believe that Kim Jong-un not being in optimal health, his not in great health, when he visited Vladivostok to meet with Vladimir Putin for the first time in April 2019, he was visibly, audibly breathing hard, audibly like this, <sighs> after walking about 50 yards. He's not in great health. He's young. I mean, he could be around for the next 40, 50 years, who knows, but he's a chain smoker. He drinks anywhere between two to three bottles of hard liquor by himself, which is impressive, I think. <laughs> but change, you know, he's not in great health. So we know that the pandemic can kill princes and paupers alike. Of course, people with wealth and power have greater access to health care and so on. But we remember the Prime Minister of the UK, Boris Johnson, he almost had a brush with death, and you know these things happen. This is by far the most grave, the gravest, the most serious existential threat that the North Korean leader has ever faced. They play up this fear, purportedly, fear of an imminent U.S. attack. It's not happened. The U.S. has never even really fired back when North Korea killed Americans brazenly during the Cold War. Why? Because the Korean War, it was devastating. We don't want another war in Korea. So despite trumping up fear, paranoia of US attack, North Korea, the North Korean leader, has never faced a real threat. There has never been a protest, a demonstration worthy of the name, as far as we know, on the outside, ever in North Korean history. But COVID was different. So I believe he sort of took out an in insurance policy for himself, his wife, his young children, by elevating his trusted sister 
making her basically deputy despotess. And Kim Il-jong has emphasized several times that her authority to run her government's foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis South Korea, the U.S. and other nations, comes from her brother, the party, and the state. And she's made several threats in writing of preemptive nuclear strike against her peaceful neighboring state, South Korea, and emphasized, emphasized that she's been vested by her brother with this authority to move troops, unleash her nation's, quote, nuclear forces and bring about something akin to total ruin and destruction, end quote, end of quote, nuclear forces. So she's not no joke. She's for real. And I see in North Korean documentaries genuine affection, affinity, brotherly, sisterly love between the two. At summit meetings with President Trump, with President Xi, President Moon, the two siblings, they look at each other, glance at each other, steal a glimpse of each other, and then kind of like smile, as if to communicate that this day is going swimmingly. So I believe for the foreseeable future, the sister has the absolute trust and support of her brother. And they've played this role reversal. You know, Kim Jong-un used to be the bad cop to her sister, who was more charming and agreeable, the good cop. Since 2020, she's assumed the role of even the worst cop. She threatened in June 2020 to blow up a tower, a four-story building, the North Korea-South Korea Joint Liaison Office, located in North Korea, just across the border, built and maintained 100% with South Korean taxpayer money. She said, this useless building, it will be gone. You'll see soon. And three days later, demolished it was. Earlier that month, in June, June 4th, 2020, at about 6.15, 6.14, pardon me, 6.14 p.m., she issued a a.m., pardon me, she issued a written statement calling on South Korea to pass a criminal law to criminalize South Korean human rights activists who sent anti-North Korea leaflets across the border. Four hours later, amazingly, the chief spokesman of the Ministry of Unification, this government agency of South Korea dealing with North Korea, called for an unscheduled press conference and said, yes, we'll work on it. And then other agencies, the National Defense Ministry, the Blue House, President's Office, all chimed in. And the law was passed in December that year. So I wonder if such a demand had come from the less photogenic, more surly looking brother. If Kim Jong-un had said, you'd better criminalize such activities, and as you know, Sharing, imparting, receiving, sharing information is a basic universal right. It's enshrined in Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But North Korea said, don't do it. And South Korea complied, for whatever reason, in the name of peace and reconciliation, I suppose. I don't think South Korea would have acted with such alacrity had the demand come from her brother. And here's my main point that I strive to make in my modest book and my last uh, point. She is young, she is very clever, very witty, on occasion very polite, but she is the deputy dear leader of one of the worst totalitarian oppressive states in human history. Just because she's a young photogenic woman, I think the latent tendency to patronize young women in many of us, may I humbly suggest in some women as well, to underestimate a young woman, not to think that she's not smart, but to presume that we, by virtue of my charisma, wisdom, intelligence, she's malleable. I can control her. I can even teach her a lesson. 
That kind of patronizing outlook works to our detriment and to their advantage. I believe she will be the face of North Korea's next charm offensive, and they always revert to a charm offensive, a post-provocation peace ploy. They don't go berserk and just escalate endlessly. They know when to dial things back. And at that time, when the North Korean cruel dictator comes out saying, let's talk, there are unreasonably high expectations, exuberance even. We think this time it's real. They mean it. They want peace, reconciliation, denuclearization, and all those good things. But I've watched Rambo, one, two, three, <laughs> four, five, and the next one will be Rambo six. And by the time you've seen Rambo three, you have a pretty good idea how the movie ends. And I know this sounds very cynical and pessimistic, but no, they don't mean well. But they know how to play that game. And when she says, I want to come to the UN, let's meet in New York, or let me visit the White House, it will be, politically speaking, exceedingly difficult for any president to turn their back on her and say, no, th thank you, because then you will look like the petulant party uninterested in peace. So that's an advantage, North Korea. And we must be guarded, and we must take the first sister of North Korea, the first nuclear despotess in world history, very seriously. Thank you. So we're gonna, I'm sure we have a lot of questions, but I'm standing here, so I'm going to go first. Um, <laughs> Because this is this is really a fascinating character, and I'm wondering if you can um, give those of us who have not had the opportunity to get the book yet a little bit more of a picture of her. Um, first of all, um, it, her brother or half brother um, was assassinated, yes. uh, so there must be something about her that's that prevails, um, and then another seems like opportunity to understand her is something that you said had her signature on it, which is the death of Otto Warmbier. So I'm wondering if you could just quickly touch on those two sort of um, aspects of her, of her power, really. Of course. Thank you. <clears throat> Kim Jong-nam was the eldest son of the second generational leader, Kim Jong-il. He met a brutal fate in being assassinated in a crowded international airport in Malaysia in February 2017 with one of the deadliest chemical agents, chemical weapons known to mankind, VX nerve agent. In broad daylight, it's brazen. There are little kids crawling around. There are infirmed elderly folks. But in such a crowded setting with cameras everywhere, Kim Jong-un had his half-brother assassinated, Kim Jong-nam. Why? Because Kim Jong-nam is the eldest son of their father. Kim Jong-nam had come out, perhaps unwisely, in 2009, 2010, and spoke up against another generational father-to-son succession. So I thought perhaps he's a marked man, even back in 2010. They took their time, but they did it in a brazen, cruel way, telling the world, we have these chemical weapons. Come and buy them. This is what happens if you defy or challenge me. It was so uh, cruel. I enrolled at the Geneva International School in Geneva, Switzerland, on the same day as Kim Jong-nam. We all knew he was North Korean. The South Korean ambassador was there. Uh, all little boys and girls from non-Swiss countries, foreign students, were told to bring a little flag of our national, of our nation, either Korean flag. The ambassador um, said hello to me, knowing who I was, the son of a junior colleague of his. And then the ambassador went up to Kim Jong-nam and said, presuming he was also from South Korea, where are you from? And he said in North Korean accent, 
I'm from the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, as in North Korea. And the ambassador almost freaked out. His bodyguards, <laughs> Kim Jong-nam's bodyguards almost freaked out. And that was the end of the conversation. He was three years my junior by age, so I never had the same, I was never in the same class with him. But I would see him in the cafeteria. And everyone told me, if he comes up to you and strikes up a conversation, just walk. Don't talk to him, because he's from North Korea. So my point here is, in North Korea, in the dynasty, fratricide, killing your brother, avunculicide, killing your uncle, nepoticide, killing your nephew. I looked up all these words, they're real, so. <laughs> Their history is rife with such cruel, vengeful actions, as are the dynasties, monarchies of the past. So North Korea really is an absolutist kind of medieval style monarchy pretending to be a republic. Otto Warmbier was a top student at the University of Virginia who went on a group tour to North Korea. He had visited Cuba with his mother. Before that, he was curious about the world. And then he was detained uh, while on his way to the airport or trying to take off from Pyongyang on January 2nd and charged with a bogus accusation, allegation of, quote, warm beer entered the DPRK, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, under the guise of a tourist with the connivance of the CIA to bring down the central unity of the North Korean state. I may have bungled that up a little bit, but it's almost verbatim. This was the official statement on January 21st, um, 2016. Thereafter, he was forced to give a bogus forced confession on leap day, February 29th, 2016. And he looked visibly shaken, of course. And he said he had committed a serious crime, but North Koreans have been very kind, uh, healthcare-wise. He even got to uh, go to the sauna once a week and so on. But he was valiant. He put in there a lot of messages that only his family would get. For example, Otto uh, misspelled, mis, you know, um, he, he, he talked about his father's company and um, didn't say the right name of the company. He said his family was extremely um, poor, under extreme financial stress, which is not true. They're very affluent. He said that his United Methodist Church had put him up to this shenanigan. He never went to church. He was a Jew. He said that he had to raise $200,000, and the church promised to give it to him if he did something bad to North Korea, because he's the eldest child of a very poor family, and he had to send his younger siblings, two younger siblings, to college in the United States. Have you ever heard of such a thing, the onus of the oldest child, like having to work hard to pay for the tuition of your younger siblings. This is an old-fashioned Korean virtue, sacrifice, and so on. So the state injected, put a lot of pressure on North Korea to read their statement, but also while doing that, also managed to put in some covert messages for his family. The North Korean authorities never allowed even the Swedish diplomats to gain access to Otto. And he was released, finally, 18 months later in June 2017, in a state of brain dead, not calm coma, but in an anguished, blind, deaf, mute, painful state. That's how he was returned. And he died a few days thereafter. So I see in that forced confession the same kind of sardonic, cruel, personalized, insulting um, epithets and invective that I see in many of Kim Yo-jong's 40 statements. In 2014, North Korean propaganda turned particularly vile and personal. I mean, they've said nasty things before, uh, calling President Reagan in the 80s, quote, human trash. That's a very popular North Korean refrain, human scum, human trash. They've hurled that epithet at many South Korean presidents and so on, too.
But in 2014, I mentioned before this monumental UN report on human rights in North Korea published in 2014. The main drafter is a very distinguished, retired Australian judge called Michael Kirby, who's openly gay. And North Korea referred to Judge Kirby as, quote, a disgusting lecher with a 40-year career in homosexuality, end quote. At the time, North Korea repeatedly referred to the female president of South Korea, Park Geun-hye, the first female elected leader in a democracy in East Asia, as, quote, dirty old prostitute in a particularly nasty invective on May 25th, 2015, North Korea referred to her as, quote, stinky Obama pelvis licking, skirt lifting, dirty old whore, end quote, and referred to President Obama in vile racist language, calling him, quote, a wicked black monkey that should go back to his natural habitat in Africa and feed off the breadcrumbs thrown at him by tourists and so on. And I thought it, as did many other North Korea watchers, very strange. Why all this sudden spurt of personalized, homos, you know, homophobic, racist, sexist invective? I only realized later it has her signature snark. She was running the very powerful propaganda and agitation department at the time, at least since 2012. She would have signed off on all these, not to say she wrote them all by herself. No, they recruit the best writers out of college, best lit literature majors, but you know, she is not a courteous, demure woman. Okay, um, so we'll, uh, we're gonna try and get some questions in. I know uh, Val had a question. Um, we'll bring the mic to you. And what is the story? We all know this at World Boston, questions end in a question mark. Um, so we'll try and get in a couple. Maybe we'll take uh, yours in, in another one at the same time. Then we'll come over here, Elena. Um, we have someone over here. We'll take two at once, okay. Yeah, um, uh, thank you. I'm Valentin Moradam from North, uh, Northeastern University. I'm almost speechless, actually, um, after your uh, wonderfully informative um, lecture. Um, well, as you were speaking earlier about all these terrible statistics about militarism and male mobilization, I was thinking also of Eritrea. Um, I don't know if there is any kind of connection over there. But my question is about um, the sister. Um, what ticks her off? Uh, is she a sociopath or um, is it, um, for example, some of these, uh, is there something rational there in terms of her infective and her anger? Is it the joint U.S.-South Korean military exercises that take place? What is it that enrages her so? Great. So thank you. And then we're going to come up to our friend here at this front table here, and then you can do two, sure. two at once. Hello, everyone. Like, I used to be Dr. Lee's student at Fletcher, and the successful Dr. Lee for giving an A for your course. And, <laughs> and my question is, like, you, you used to mention that you use a lot of like, uh, Chinese sources in your literature. I'm just wondering, like, uh, what, uh, like, how do we, like, uh, reverse Chinese people, uh, f uh, perceive like, you know, Kim yong jo or Kim's family differently compared to people in Korea? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so, Professor, thank you for your question. Eritrea and North Korea are to date the only two nations in the world that have refused COVID vaccine, free you know, donations of COVID vaccines. So there's that commonality. North Korea has sent armies, um, trained armies in many countries, over a dozen countries in Africa. So it's not true that North Korea is a hermit nation. During the Cold War, North Korea maintained diplomatic missions in many countries, about 50 around the world, which is small, comparatively speaking. But North Korea today has diplomatic relations with over 160 nations. Uh, it's just that they're not as engaged or open or transparent in terms of communications, in terms of their policy as the more conventional nations of the world. What ticks her off? I don't know, but according to a family Japanese chef who um, cooked for Kim Jong-il for many, many years, uh, he's written, he is Kenji Fujimoto, which is a pseudonym. 
he became something of a minor prophet when North Korea did declare that Kim Jong-un, not his older brother, so the three children, there's Kim Jong-chol from the same mom, who's the eldest and a boy, and then there's Kim Jong-un, and then the youngest is Kim Yo-jong, the sister. Among the three, uh, the Japanese sushi chef said that the older brother, he has no acumen, no interest in politics or power, just does his thing, play the guitar, he's very good. And then um, the father, Kim Jong-il, was tormented because his youngest child, who he and his de facto wife called and referred to as our sweet princess, my princess, Yeo Jong, she's the smartest, but she's a girl. So Kim Jong-il picked the brother over the sister, the son over the daughter. According to this chef, um, Kim Yo-jong, even as a young girl, was always interested in, well, she was bossy. She was smart. She craved attention. And uh, when she was nine or so, she had, pardon me, when she was 10, she had Kim Jong-chol, six years older brother. She reprimanded him for uh, entering an old girl's uh, cinema theater, watching a movie uh, inside one of their palatial mansions uh, because the brother was interested in a 16-year-old attendant of the sister, the princess. And when she found her older brother, she dragged him out and pushed him out of the theater. That's how bossy and controlling she was. I think to be the supreme leader of North Korea uh, this is a very strange and unique sense of power in our world today because you are, you have the divine right to rule by convention. You are almost a deity, a god-like figure in North Korea. According to Stephen Began, who was the U.S. Special Representative for North Korea and number two in the State Department under Secretary Pompeo during the Trump administration, Mr. Began sat with and, and with Pompeo and another CIA um, analyst, sat with Kim Jong-un and Kim Yo-jong in Pyongyang for three hours negotiating. And he asked a very thorny question to Kim Jong-un through the North Korean interpreter. What are you going to do about the hungry people of North Korea? And the poor interpreter, can you imagine? He conveyed that to his boss. And Kim Jong-un looked genuinely perplexed, like, what kind of question is this? And then he did, <laughs> this is a Korean thing, like, it's beneath me. Don't even ask me it's such a stupid question. So I think to have that kind of power to be above everyone as almost the supreme deity is very inviting. And I think she craves power. And we've seen Kim Jong-un parade around his 12-year-old or so young daughter, very cute, they show affection, the father and the daughter for each other. Maybe one day she'll become the first female supreme leader of North Korea. Who knows? Maybe one day she will consider her auntie, Kim Yo-jong, the way that Kim Jong-un and Kim Yo-jong did their uncle, Chang song taek who was the de facto number two person soon after, you know, after Kim Jong-il died, but then was humiliated and tortured and killed in the winter of 2013, maybe Kim Yo-jong, if she feels threatened by then her adult niece or nephew, maybe she won't forget the experience of that wrathful, nipping winter of 2013 and choose to strike first. Who knows? I had a lot of help. I had a student, <laughs> wonderful um, research student, uh, ass uh, assistant, student from the mainland, also another student from Taiwan. They looked through every reference to Kim Yo-jong and Kim Jong-un and um, shared with me their compilation. And I chose whatever I deemed to be relevant to my story. The Chinese got it wrong too. They did not get Kim Jong-un's correct name or Kim Yo-jong's correct name until North Korea told the world. So that's how secretive North Korea is when it comes to basic biographical facts about the royal family, there's a good reason for it because one reason is their mother, Kim Jong-un and Kim Yo-jong's mother, Ko Yong-hee, who died in 2004, she was born in Japan. What's wrong with that? 
any resettlers from Japan, they are relegated and their progeny across generations to the lowest class upon birth. Moreover, Ko Young-hye's sister, so their aunt, Kim Jong-un's aunt, and her family defected to the principal enemy of the DPRK, as North Korea says, the United States of America. And when you have a defector, let alone you know, to the US, when, when you have somebody who escapes North Korea, then the repercussions are severe for the family, the immediate family, even relatives. So, and Kim Il-sung was uh, a pianist, an organ player at a church, the grandfather. Whereas Christianity, Christians are relegated also to concentration camps and to the lowest rung of the social political ladder. So this trifecta, Christian in the family, great-grandparents, church deaconess and so on, and then defector, Japanese-born mother, these secrets need to be kept a secret. Not because they fear an insurrection, but because it may have implications in terms of handing power down to the next generation, which even for a state like North Korea is always a thorny proposition. Question. Yeah, so we have a question from Zoom from Taehee Lee, who is an investigator in South Korea who analyzes North Korea's system. And they're wondering about your thoughts on the expected impacts of your book. And um, surely North Korea monitors your book. So do you think it will have an impact on her position positively or negatively? Thank you. We, Another we question? We did not invent that question. That's a real question. <laughs> no, it's from my wonderful former student at the Fletcher oh. School, who's doing very important work on raising awareness on human rights violations in North Korea. I did not expect that from you, Tehi, but well, you know, I have a small son to support, so I hope they don't take too much interest in me. I'm just a small fish, but um, my uh, university issued a uh, computer has been repeatedly hacked and it's been scrubbed, but that's, you know, part of the course for North Korea watchers. What kind of impact do I hope that the book will have? Well, in a very flattering review uh, in the Wall Street Journal of my humble book, the reviewer, who um, is a North Korea expert, said that the book should be read to North Korean citizens, North Korean people, so that they know how underprivileged, how um, gruesomely repressed they are to Koreans south of the border, so that they understand that their famine, their hunger, constant malaise and diseases and constant you know, hunger are not due to climate change or U.S. sanctions. And it's a marvel of nature. You know, a lot of people, including North Koreans, say that the people are hungry because of climate change and U.S. sanctions. But there were no U.S. sanctions worthy of the name until 2016, when the first U.S. sanctions legislation on North Korea came to be. And um, climate change, that it stops each year without fail, right at the border with China and South Korea, no one's going hungry in those nations. It's a marvel of nature. So again, it's a man-made, man-sustained, miserable situation. And I hope that uh, whatever um, argument that may sound plausible or interesting, depending on the reader, gets to be conveyed one day to North Koreans who might find also uh, some of my assertions uh, of interest. Thank you. Dr. Sung Yoon Lee, thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful discussion. Thank you very thank much. You.